The year is 1992, and I am eight years old. It is my second time on an airplane, but I'm still a little bit nervous as I'm wedged between my mom and my dad on a very busy airplane. One hour and 44 minutes into that flight, I heard the words that no one ever wants to hear while on an airplane. May I have your attention, please? This is your captain speaking. Don't be alarmed, but we are currently experiencing engine failure. (laughs) There were shrieks, screams all around me, some from surprise, shock, and some from pure terror. My parents next to me were sputtering, flailing, panicking, and all I wanted to do was be able to breathe because our plane had lost oxygen. I saw the oxygen masks hanging above me, and I tried to reach out and grab them, but they were just outside of my reach. My mom, sitting next to me, saw me trying to reach the oxygen masks. She grabbed it, tried to put it on me first, but she lost consciousness before she could. So there I was, eight years old, unaware of why my mom wasn't responding and unaware of why this auction mask wasn't working. Neither my mom or I had remembered the flight attendant's warning at the beginning of the flight, that if you're traveling with someone who needs assistance, secure your mask first before helping someone else. Well, flash forward 16 years later, I didn't die in that plane accident. I still travel. But this question of whether or not we should be helping ourselves first before helping others has continued to come up between my mother and I. I began serving others when I was 16 years old. My my sister had married a Salvadorian, and I would spend my summers down there. Well, one summer, an earthquake ripped through through their country, and we spent our whole summer visiting orphanages, helping rebuild roads, and just helping people. And I knew in my heart that is what I was meant to do for the rest of my life. So as an adult, I tried to go on international humanitarian trips about every one to two years. I love to visit countries I haven't yet visited, and I love to work with organizations that really help try to train and educate others. Every time I book my next humanitarian trip, I always call my mother, and every single time she sighs, frowns, and asks me, why must you continue to go to these dangerous countries? Why must you continue to jeopardize your life just to help save someone else's? Don't you know that we have poverty here in America? Don't you know that there are people struggling to survive here too? My mother raises this really interesting question and it goes straight back to the time of our plane accident. If she would have tried to help save herself first, then we both could have been helped. So I ask this question to you today. Where does your oxygen mask matter the most? Should we be helping Americans before worrying about third world countries' poverty? Poverty is a problem that cannot be solved with a Band-Aid. A lot of people think that if all the rich countries got together and helped save those poor countries, then poverty would be solved. It's not that simple. In my experience, poverty will never be eradicated by foreign aid alone. It goes back to the value of education. As a teacher of eight years, I know that one of my most important roles as a teacher is to help educate my students to become self-sufficient members. If they can learn life skills and learn how to do them on their own, then they'll be successful members of society. Imagine how detrimental it would be for me as a teacher to walk into my classroom and do every assignment for every struggling student. We kind of have that same mentality when it comes to poverty. We want to go into their country and do it for them, but that doesn't really help anyone. As a humanitarian with a bleeding heart who just wants to save every child, every begging child, every panhandler, every outstretched hand, I understand the mentality of wanting to help everyone. But that doesn't necessarily help long term. We need to start thinking about long term solutions to help solve poverty. But once we have our short term solutions, when you're sitting there gasping for air, you need that auction mask right now, not a lecture on how to improve your plane's failing engine, right? But once we are clothed and bathed and have clean drinking water and are safe, then we need to start thinking about the long-term solutions. What if we, instead of just writing a check or mailing a crate of food, 
we went into their country and helped them learn how to farm, to, build, to make their own food, to dig their own wells for clean drinking, drinking water, and to build their own materials, for, to build their own houses, then we wouldn't have to go and do it for them. I mean, as a mom, the last thing I want is my children living with me until I'm 30, right? <sighs> So every time my mother would ask me these questions about whether or not I should be helping locally instead of internationally, I was truly conflicted. I had no idea how to answer her question. I honestly didn't know why I wasn't spending all my time at the local homeless shelter and instead spending thousands on dollars on international flights. Perhaps there was some part of me that really wanted just to go and explore the world, visit new faces, hear new languages, see new people. Or perhaps there was a little part of me that thought these third world countries actually had real poverty. But does that mean that America has pseudo poverty? If you've ever visited Oakland, St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, you could see the real poverty that we have here in America too. There are thousands of people that are struggling with poverty every single day that need our help too. It wasn't until I made it to Ecuador in 2014 on my sixth humanitarian trip that I finally was able to kind of piece all of this together. There, they treat unwanted children like stray dogs. If they can't afford to feed them or just don't want them, they drop them off in these open street markets and never look back. They don't know their names, their parents' names, their birth dates. They don't know really anything about their identity. They often get bitten by dogs, spiders, scorpions. They have to pickpocket and scavenge for food. The women who work in these street markets try to take care of them as best as they can, but most of them are just struggling to make ends meet themselves. So oftentimes they have to sleep on plantain leaves all by themselves at night where the temperatures can dip very low in the winter time. It was about two weeks into my trip that I saw a two-year-old girl digging through feces just to find some undigested corn just so that she had something to fill her stomach. And it was then that I finally could answer my mother's question. Poverty in our country is a real problem. I have personally taught students who were sleeping in their cars, who couldn't bathe because they couldn't afford a bar of soap who had to wear the same pair of pants every single day, well, because it was their only pair of pants. But is it my job to compare my students' poverty with the children sleeping on plantain leaves in Ecuador? Absolutely not, because poverty is poverty. It might look different, but it feels the same, and it hurts the same. So. Should my mother have probably have tried to save herself first that day instead of worrying about me? But I think that we could all benefit more from that mentality that she had that day of thinking of everyone else before thinking about ourselves. So it's your job to figure out where your oxygen mask matters the most. There is a soup kitchen down the street that needs some volunteers. There is a panhandler on 17th and Hit Road that just needs a hand up. And there is an AIDS orphanage in Honduras that needs some supplies to build a, build a playground. All of them need our help. So figure out where your heart leads you. Because when you are struggling to breathe, you deserve the breath of fresh air when your plane is plummeting to the ground.